In this video, we're going to look at doing a confirmatory analysis in JESS. If you want to follow along, you can download this data set. A link to it will be in the show notes. In order to do a confirmatory factor analysis, we're going to go to the factor drop down. You see we have these three options. We want confirmatory factor analysis. While this video doesn't um, discuss theory, I'll just mention briefly that confirmatory factor analysis is done when we already have a theory about which items load on which factors and we just want to confirm that that theory is correct. <clears throat> so in this case I, I have a theory about which items go in factor 1 and which go in factor 2. Clicking that plus sign as I did can add a factor. The minus sign will take away a factor. I'm going to um, first select on the items that I want to go in factor one. And in case you're not comfortable with this, just want to note the best way to do it is just hold down the control key as you select them. And then you can pick all at once the ones you want. and then just hit this arrow to pop them over or you can click and drag. So you just want to make sure you can confirm here that you've got all the right ones. You notice they didn't vanish from this side with some analyses variables do if they can't be used again. But in this case they could be used again. Um, if I wanted to have a cross-loaded item, meaning it loads on two factors, then I would put it just put it in both boxes. Okay, And that would be all there is to it. 17, what's it, 14, no, it needs 16, 17, and 19. Okay, and so I pop all of these over here. Hopefully I've got the right ones in the right places. I can just look through them all, you know, to check. We're checked over here. It, of course, immediately just does the analysis live. And you can see over here that I've got my items, the ones that load on each factor. I have the loading estimates there and there. I've got p-values showing they're all statistically significant. I have the overall model chi-square over here. If we scroll down, we'll find that we get factor variances, which were just set to be one. I have the covariance between the factors here. And I have residual variances down below. OK, so I have that basic. Um, output. Um, because these factor variances were set to 1 here, I essentially have a standardized solution. So these estimates here are all going to be less than 1, or the absolute value of them will be less than 1. And um, this is going to be really equivalent to a correlation because I have this standardized solution. There are some other options if you want to do it differently. Now let's look at the options we have down below. The first option we have is if we want to include a second order factor. So for example, I have um, a higher level factor that um, factor one and factor two are just sub factors of. I could just pop those both over there and it would add that in. Next thing is the model options. This is if I want to see the means of the various um, variables. Um, or if I want to assume my factors are uncorrelated, I can do that, okay? Also, this is the factor scaling. If I do it by um, the factor variance, you have to, you know, scale the, if you understand the theory of CFA, you have to decide these latent factors, factor 1 and factor 2, need to be um, scaled, put on some scale in some way. And one way to do it is to give them a mean zero variance 1. That's the default. You can also have them scaled so that their scale matches one of your variables um, or based on this effects coding, which isn't commonly done. I'll just leave that as it is. That's commonly done. Additional output. Now you probably want to look at this, which is the fit measures. See how well the model fits. So click on there and you'll see it pops up over on this side. Okay. If I scroll up, I can see that I've got really quite a lot of stuff here. Um, which fit statistics you look at will depend on probably what statistician or theorist you follow. I most often report the CFI and TLI, which, you know, they want to be as close to 1 as possible. Above 0.95 is considered good fit. 
and some people think between 0 0.90 and 0 0.95 is adequate fit, while others say not. But these are both quite high here. And then down here, we have some other statistics. The root mean score of approximation, or RMSEA, for example, we want a lower number as close to zero as possible, and people generally agree about a below 0 0.05 is good fit and below 0 0.08 is adequate fit and you see I have really good fit here okay so those fit statistics are there um, there's some other things that could be looked at um, you may want to look at if you understand the theory you know some of these things the implied or residual covariances modification indice indices are often used um, if I don't have good fit and I want to look at statistically, you know, what things I could add to the model in order to improve the fit, then that will be um, listed there. So let's go look for that in our output. There we go. Modification indices, you see that first it shows cross loadings that would improve fit. And um, basically that shows how much it would reduce the chi-score statistic. And that chi-score statistic is right up here at the top, um, right here, the second number. And the all the other fit statistics are some mathematical function of that. Most of them are um, some mathematical function of that. So how much it would improve that, then it would improve the other statistics if you added just that one path in. Um, and you see that, you know, like this cross-loading would include, increase it the most, or residual covariances. So covariances between um, two of the error variances for, vari for, you know, two of the variables. And that would be typically done, like, because wording was similar to between two items or something in meaning was particularly similar between two items on the same factor. And I, um, adding any of these can be done. I wouldn't do that, though unless there's some good theoretical reason to do it. In this case, I wouldn't do it at all because my fit is already excellent. But if you had a case, you know, where your fit wasn't quite good enough, you might find that just by adding a path or two, you can improve the fit quite a bit. And that's, again, just maybe because there's some cross-loading you didn't account for, or maybe there's some similarity in wording or meaning that means you should add these. Now, um, just, of course, keep in mind, this isn't a theory video, but, there, you know, there are other ways to improve fit, sometimes um, by removing an item that's problematic, sometimes by totally changing the factor structure, the number of factors. Um, sometimes there are problematic responses, like people didn't respond in, in, a, in a good way. You know, I sometimes get that kind of thing if I'm analyzing data done, like on middle school students and some somebody just answered a silly way or something like that then maybe there's problematic responses and those are a little bit harder to uncover but just be aware that those are that's something that you can look at here and you can give it a cutoff for you know the lowest value that you want to look at i usually don't take anything seriously that's below a 10 but um it all depends on the size of your model too Multi-group, this is something complex. I may do another video on that at some point. That's where if maybe I want to compare the model structure for the males versus the females or any other um, groups. We want to compare their or two ethnic groups or something like that. I want to compare the model fits for them. That's something that can be done here, and I'm not going to go into that detail in this video because it's fairly advanced. Plots. You probably want to look at, if we scroll down here, the model plot. The model plot gives you that um, structural equation or modeling type, you know, picture, okay, the CFA picture um, of your model. And so that's something that can be very useful. There are some um, options that you can do, do in dealing with that. Um, one is that you can rotate the plot sideways. So you can see it that direction if that looks better. The other thing, and I usually would click on that, is show the parameter estimates, and I want the standardized estimates, which are the same thing here. That's all that I have, parameter estimates. Now, you'll see that it's hard to read anything on that. Um, you can expand it. So with this little um, corner arrow thing down here, I can make it bigger in either direction that I want, okay? It might be a little easier to do it sometimes if I minimize the analysis window options window and you can just again you know you can make it larger in whichever direction you want so that you can 
see your values most clearly. Of course, this is something then you can be you can cut and paste. Um, it's a little bit problematic to make it larger, I find, because it only wants to you know increase it so much at once, and then you have to scroll down a little bit further to give it even more space so you can make it even bigger so that you can get so all your values that you can read fairly clearly and you can see it's a little hard to see the negative signs in there but it's not too bad okay it's all it's fairly readable it's something that you could probably cut and paste even to a publication if you clean it up just a little and got it to the right size so that's something that that can be um, really helpful in dealing with that particular option now under it advanced this probably should be the thing they put first the most important thing on here is what estimator is used okay and um, you see it has this automatic option the automatic option will based on the ver the data type it will choose which option um, for estimating is the best in your scenario but if you will go through your output, unless I've missed something, I you, I can't find on here where it tells me what it used. Now, if I go up in the help diet right here, this information help, it tells me that by default it does maximum likelihood if your if all your if all your variables are scale. Otherwise, it does um, WLS or weighted least squares um, by default. That's what it does. Now, um, how do you know for sure? Well, the way you know for sure is you've got to click on each of these and compare your output. That's all I found is the is the option that works for me. And I actually find here that if with this particular data, if I click on weighted least squares, it says it couldn't be estimated. So I click on the next one. If I click on all the various options, the only two that it actually gives me information for are these last two options. And um the, the the results match the last one so that that's the one that that was done here um i guess it's giving it the best solution i don't know how it what it runs to come to that conclusion now if i wanted to do this with maximum likelihood which i probably do the only real solution is to change my variable types so if i were to i'm going to go back see the data go up here you see that i have these 20 variables listed as ordinal um, is very commonly done when you have five or more categories and your data is not too extremely, extremely skewed to treat ordinal data as if it were interval ratio. So if I were to do that, um, I just have to click on all these little, you know, triple bars and change them to scale, which is interval ratio. If I were to do that, then it's going to actually run it as maximum likelihood by default, or let me choose that option and it'll run it just fine. So that's something to be aware of. I'll show you that. It's not too too much trouble to, to click on and, and change all of those quite quick and easy. Okay, so now I come back over here and um, if I click back on the auto, either the auto option, it's going to do it by, um, by uh, maximum likelihood Okay, I see my fits uh, actually dropped a little bit, but um, or I can click on the ML option, and I'll get that same those same results. So I have that that option to me by saying, let's treat this as scale data. So I have to actually tell it to do that in that particular case. So that's the basics of of running a confirmatory factor analysis here in Stata. I mean Jasp. <laughs>